Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. Coming up on today's show, 2024 will be the biggest election year in history, as more than 60 countries representing half of the world's population will be heading to the polls. Greg Swenson, the chairman of Republicans Overseas UK, will shortly be joining me here in the studio to discuss the Trump trials and how they will impact the race to the White House over the next few months. And Bava Tampa, an actor from the Democratic Republic of Congo will be assessing the fallout from the last election of 2023, which witnessed Felix Shiskedi secure a controversial second term. And Japan Airlines has said it expects losses of more than 100 million US dollars after one of its planes were destroyed when it collided with another aircraft on the runway at Tokyo's Haneda Airport this week. Andrea Spade, an aviation journalist and podcaster, will soon be joining me from Hamburg in Germany for his assessment of what went wrong and how the sector can move forward. Then later, I'll be looking back at some of the biggest business news stories of the week. But first, let's begin the show by taking a look at what's been trending on social media platforms this week. And we begin with LinkedIn. In this post, the Nigerian Exchange Group, or NGX as it's referred to, announces the appointment of Mr. Temi Popola as Group Managing Director director and chief executive officer, taking over the reins of Oscar Onyema OON, who is retiring. The post goes on to thank Onyema for his exceptional leadership and invaluable contributions to the group. Temi Popola began his new role on the 1st of January. And on X, we get this from Tesla, an update on their fourth quarter vehicle production and deliveries in 2023. The electric vehicle firm announced that it produced just shy of half a million vehicles and delivered over 480,000. This marks a production growth of 35% year on year and a delivery growth of 38%. Then this on Facebook, as the war between Israel and Hamas rages on in the Middle East. Last week, hundreds of UK health workers shut down the central London HQ of US tech giant and spy firm Palantir to disrupt its business after accusing them of profiteering from the war. Their mass picket, supported by Alliance for Water Justice in Palestine, disrupted entry to and exit from the building. As mentioned at the top of the show, more than 60 countries representing half of the world's population will head to the polls at some point this year, including here in the UK. Following wild speculation about the date of the British general election, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announced on Thursday that it is his working assumption that he will hold a general election in the second half of this year. The media had previously reported the ballot could take place in May. The Prime Minister's announcement followed a New Year's address from Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer. During his speech, he issued a plea to the British public to believe in the country and in politics again. The Labour Party is currently 18 points ahead in the polls. Well, for more on this, I was earlier joined in the studio by our Downing Street correspondent, Simon Pusey. Simon, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's quite interesting, actually. Um, we had a reflection show last week and a lot of the content from last year was about Rishi Sunak and his New Year pledges. He doesn't appear to have made any this year. And it pe appears to be that it's Sakir Starmer that started off the year, you know, talking about the general election, pulling across the Labour mandate. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think he was trying to come across as being quite sort of statesman-like and premier, uh, you know, in waiting like um, Sir Keir Starmer. So, yeah, he's had a, a sort of New Year's speech um, talking about um, what Labour will do if and when they get into power. Um, he used the word hope um, 17 times in the speech. Um, and he was talking about the fact that, you know, voters have a choice here. I think Labour and Sir Keir Starmer are <coughs> ahead of the next general election. Their main their main sort of goal is to get people out voting. I think they're, they're, they're way ahead in the polls, of course. Yes. But I think the one thing that could kind of slip it for them is if uh, a, a large majority of the electorate Apathy. just think just think it's not what's they're the point. The they're all the same. Politicians, doesn't matter. You know, yeah. and Sakir is not too dissimilar to, you know, many people would say, you know, people on the conservative central left. Champagne socialist. Um, exactly. So they're like, that. that's what he's trying, I think, to, to rouse is some kind of belief and hope in the electorate that things can get better, things can 
can change. Um, and so I think that's why I was using hope so many times. Um, he said, do not listen to the siren voices that say we're all the same. Um, he also talks about priority for economic growth. He's trying to make Labour come across as yeah, this. The, eco the <coughs> economy is not really Labour's strong point. No, it's not. It? So he's trying to change that kind yeah. of cliche or that kind of um, belief in, in people that, yeah, exactly, Labour are all for the wor working person, but not necessarily in terms of exactly. Um, and he said there's going to be growth ahead of cuts. And obviously, Labour are often known as, as the, uh, sorry, growth in, uh, ahead of um, uh, ahead of um, tax cuts, yeah. Um, so he's talking about Project Hope for a downtrodden UK. Um, and actually, just a, a few hours later, Rishi Sunak comes out. There's been a lot of pressure on him to talk yes. about when there's going to be a general election. We know it has to happen before January 2025. Um, a lot of people were talking about May, Labour Party saying it's the worst That's kept right. secret, the Lib Dems saying that you know they need to have a general election sooner rather than later. Mm. Um, and everyone, for some reason, around Westminster was thinking May, which when you're so far behind in the polls and you've got a choice to do it, whenever you want before January 2025. Seems a bit weird to do it before the last possible chance you can do it. Yeah, so quite early. He was saying, he says it's his working assumption now that it's going to be in the second half of the year. So that'll be mm. after May. Six so, months. So it could be December. <clears throat> so it could be, I think most people are thinking sort of November. I think December okay. would be an interesting time. But yeah, around about November, maybe early December. Um, and that just gives him as long as possible, Rishi Sunak, to do something with those pledges, stop the boats, turn the economy around, inflation, yeah. you know. Um, and we always say a week is a long time in politics. Um, so anything can happen. But if you look back in 2024, it was very much... Sakir Starmer and Labour's year, wasn't it? There was, you know, the, the the issue with Gaza and a few other little things, but it was really Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives that were, um, you know, trying Behind. to put out fires left, right and centre with various by-elections. Although in December we did get some quite good news, didn't we? Well, we're on inflation. The inflation, yeah, exactly, the economy. Boat crossings. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A, a few little things. I mean, boat crossings are never going to work in Rishi's favour because he, he says we're going to stop the boats. Well, they're never going to stop the boats. We know they're never going to stop the boats. So I don't know why he came out and said mm. we're definitely going to stop the boats because that is in possible but yeah exactly Down things things can happen um things can change um you know um you never know what kind of scandal could come out of uh, the Labour camp or for Sakir Starmer. Um, but at the moment, it does look like, yeah, it's going to be a, a winter um, election. Um, and hopefully the fact that, well, I think Rishi Sunak coming out and saying this, saying it's my working assumption that they will have an election in the second half of the year. I think he wants people to stop, to stop talking about it. You know, let's, yeah. let's not stop focusing on when the election is going to be. Let's see what happens uh, when they meet across the dispatch box in Westminster next week. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Japan Airlines has said it expects losses of more than 100 million US dollars after one of its planes was destroyed when it collided with another aircraft on the runway at Tokyo's Haneda Airport this week. All 379 people on board miraculously escaped, but tragically, five of the six crew from the other aircraft were killed. Authorities are still investigating what led to the accident. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by aviation journalist and podcaster Andrea Spaeth, who joins me from Hamburg in Germany. So earlier this week, we learned that four UK-based inspectors are being sent to Japan to investigate the awful collision that we all uh, witnessed. What do you think these inspectors will be looking for? It's a routine that every country that's in some way involved with a crashed aircraft has their own inspectors they can send. And of course, the UK connection here is mostly the Rolls Royce engines of that aircraft. So that's basically the main reason the UK is coming, because the Airbus is built technically in France. And uh, so, of course, the airline is Japanese and it happened in Japan. So all these countries will be part of the investigation. And they're probably doing all the same because they're sifting through the evidence, meaning the wreckage, basically, and also, of course, securing all kinds of recordings of ATC and uh, traffic control and their conversations and probably some radar records and other things, just evidence of any kind that's available to kind of get closer to the actual cause. In this case, of course, I think the UK people here will not have the central role because there's not really an engine issue at play here. Uh, and the engines, interestingly, if you watch, if you see the pictures of the wreckage, it's very charred. So it's not very much left, actually, of the fuselage, which is built of, out of uh, carbon fire for the first time in this generation aircraft. But you see what's almost unharmed are the engines, both engines, rolls Royce engines, and the wings and the flaps. So that's still there. The rest is basically gone. From that, what the Japanese authorities have released, the conversation that has taken place is quite clear. So the uh, Coast Guard aircraft was advised to stop a specific stopping point where it's meant to hold for entering the runway later when it's clear to do so. And the captain of the Coast Guard aircraft even reread and so confirmed this order by ATC and said, okay, we're stopping here at this point. 
Um, but in reality, this did not happen, and the aircraft actually strayed onto the active runway at a time when it was not authorized to do so. And actually right now, a few days after the crash, uh, the main uh, focus right now is on a different item. It's a, a red bar stopping light that's integrated into the tarmac, so into the concrete of the of the of the taxiway, and that was inoperable. And pilots were already advised by a so-called NOTAM, which is a notice to airmen, which is standard procedure, like airports, for example, communicating to pilots that some systems temporarily are out of order. And that was the case that day with this kind of visual uh, guidance system, uh, the pilot of the Coast Guard plane should have seen green dotted lights in front of him, then authorizing him visually to enter the runway. And these lights were not there. And so there was this black on the runway. He didn't see any lights. That was a, that's a given. So that's even uh, another reason, another factor that probably might have played a role that he was not aware and not visually aware that he was still barred from entering the runway. Entering the runway. So this system that was inoperable and the um, reactions of the Coast Guard pilot to this missing link of the usual safety chain, that's at the focus of the investigation right now. Andreas Spaeth, aviation journalist and podcaster, joining us from Hamburg in Germany. Thank you so much for your expertise and time today. Before we head to the break, let's examine more election news, this time the results of the recently held elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which will see the return of incumbent Felix Shisekedi. For more on the reactions of the disputed result, I'm now being joined by DRC activist and Africa analyst Vava Tampa. Vava joins me from here in the British capital. Vava Tampa, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. It's always a pleasure um, diving into your expert knowledge of what's happening in the DRC. I was saying to you off camera that if not for the opinion piece you wrote in uh, the British publication, The Guardian, earlier this week, the election would have slipped my mind, which is shocking because the DRC is geopolitically a powerhouse, not just on the continent, but around the world. Uh, provisional results have shown that Felix Shisekedi has won a second term. I've read your piece. Our viewers may not have. Talk to me about what your thoughts are on this election. Well, thank you very much for having me. Quite clearly, this is a fraudulent result. Uh, Chisekete did not win the elections. Uh, Chisekete could not have won in a free and fair election. So he organised what has been a very chaotic and shambolic election. What evidence we do you have of that, Vava? Well, look, we know, for instance, that one third of polling stations across the country did not open. So Congo had 75,000 polling stations. One third, that's about 25,000 station, polling stations did not open. Yet, somehow, the government claims that they have received results for around 68,000 um, uh, 68, polling stations. So we are asking ourselves, where were those other polling stations coming from? In addition... We also have plenty of evidence, particularly from uh, observer missions, who actually asked for the election to be cancelled and to be rerun. And those evidence are of people close to Felix Tshisekedi, people in the government, having voting machine in their house, essentially having their own personal polling station so they can cheat, so that Felix Tshisekedi can secure this fraudulent result. So Chisakedi did not win. This is a fraud at a large scale. Uh, Vava Tampa, DLC activist and campaigner, also a great uh, writer. If anybody wants to read uh, that opinion piece, they can find it um, online. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. And of course, you must come back. We've got to keep talking about what's happening in the DRC so we can save more lives. Thank you. Coming up on Channels Business Global, more 2024 election talk. And this time it's the Trump trials and how this will impact the race to the White House. Greg Swenson, the chairman of Republicans Overseas UK, will be joining me in the studio to discuss this. And of course, as always, I'll be looking back at some of the biggest business news stories of the week. All of this after the break. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. In a moment, I'll be speaking with Greg Swenson, but until then, here's a breakdown of some of the biggest business news stories of the week. The world's largest shipping firms are continuing to pull shipments through the Red Sea following a series of attacks by Houthi rebels along the crucial international trade route. 
as container ships are diverted around the Cape of Good Hope on the southern tip of Africa, adding thousands of miles to journeys, the disruption is driving up the cost of shipments from Asia to Europe, raising the prospect of a renewed inflation shock for the world economy. Inflation in Turkey rose to 64.8% on an annual basis in December, an acceleration from 62% in the previous month. Inflation hit a peak of 85.5% in October 2022, which led to the Turkish lira taking a steep deterioration. Economists have said the inflation spike is due to Turkey's central bank sticking to a controversial monetary policy of lowering interest rates which was spearheaded by President Erdogan. Since last summer, rates have been lifted from 8.5 to 42.5%. Recent data has revealed that China's manufacturing industry has contracted for the third month in a row. The official manufacturing PMI for December dipped to 49, below the 50-point mark that separates growth from contraction and down from 49.4 in the previous month. The figure was also far below the consensus for an increase to 49.6. Whilst it's expected that Beijing will maintain its annual 5% GDP growth target this year, in his New Year's address, President Xi admitted that the world's second largest economy was facing winds and rains. Now to my final topic. Donald Trump has asked the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn a ruling barring him from running for president in the state of Colorado. His appeal comes just a day after he challenged a similar decision in Maine. Overall, dozens of lawsuits have been filed in multiple states in America seeking to disqualify the former president from the November 2024 ballot. Well, to discuss this, I was earlier joined in the studio by Greg Swenson, who's the chairman of Republicans Overseas UK. Greg Swenson, as always, it's a pleasure to have you in the Channel's Business Global studio. It's going to be a busy year at the polls this year. I think there are about 50 elections. Right. 49 percent of the world's population. Absolutely. We'll this year. The biggest one is taking place in your That's right. great country. And probably the most controversial. I think it is controversial. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons why it is so controversial is because Donald Trump has um, at least four criminal indictments hanging over his head. Um, he denies all charges against him, as to be expected. Right. And he says that they are political moti politically motivated. What is the likelihood of Donald Trump emerging as the Republican candidate? Right now, it, it's very likely. Oh. The way he's polling, he's you know, p basically polling around 60 in the Republican mm -hmm. Party. Now, for an incumbent president, or quasi-incumbent, which he is, that's not that great. Mm -hmm. You know, in incumbents usually poll at 90. And if they poll below 90, they don't usually do well in the general election. Right. But the advantage he ha that he has is he's facing another incumbent who's polling at in the 60s. Really low. And, and you know, Biden's numbers are horrible. So it's one of those odd situations where 75% of the Americans don't want to see Trump v. Biden again. And yet it looks like both will be the candidates and they're the only ones that can lose to each other. What about so these indictments? That, that's actually helping him in the near term. And so I think the strategy from the left, from the Democrats was, let's do these indictments. They've obviously helped Trump in the in the nomination process mm -hmm. and and then they'll think maybe you know he'll lose that will hurt him in the general the the question now is yes it's helped him in the nomination process his numbers have gone up immediately from the first indictment so it's yeah. totally correlated and yet you know will it backfire on the democrats because it's starting to resonate with the general election process he's yeah. polling above biden in most polls right now you're talking yeah. about polls um great yeah. what about the actual charges could he go to jail he could because he's got very hostile juries you know he's facing you know these indictments in new york in fulton county georgia the only one he's got a friendly jury possibly is the one in florida which is the documents case so you know is there a chance sure i mean i i would argue that these these are to i would agree with president trump they are political and and the the west the, the justice system has been weaponized yeah. but ironically it's helped him in the nomination process cuz he's got this you know he he's seen as a martyr people are sympathetic to him they're seeing these political politically charged indictments and and that's really helping him you know prior to the Alvin Bragg indictment he, and CNN had him down two points to Ron DeSantis mm -hmm. the the real clear politics had him maybe up 5 or 10 
over DeSantis. That's a very small margin in a, in a nomination process that early. And Alvin Bragg in April, followed by the, the three subsequent indictments, and he shot up from 45 to 60. Shocking. So there's 15 points of resentment yeah. that's helping Trump right now. <laughs> 15 points of resentment. Um, another yeah. big topic, I, I don't know why it's been coming up so much recently, but the Capitol Hill riot. Um, in his New Year's address, Joe Biden, president, says that he wants to fight back against MAGA extremism. Yeah. He, what, what is MAGA it, extremism? MAGA, in, in general, it just means you're a Trump supporter, yeah. right? That was his campaign slogan in 2016 with the red hats. And so Biden, even though he campaigned on being a unifier and bringing normalcy, normalcy back mm -hmm. to, the, to the White House and to the country, He's actually done as much as he can to divide it. And that's one of the one of his tricks is is calling anybody who votes for Trump a MAGA extremist yeah. and, you know, talks about Jan 6 constantly, which, you know, uh, half the country argues was this horrible insurrection. The other half of the country says more than half, more yeah, than half. But Greg. yeah, I don't know about that. But really, it's just you know, just ballpark. Right. You OK. Know, that, that, you know, Republicans or most Republicans would argue it was a mostly peaceful protest used a, a, a phrase from the left. And then most Democrats will say it was a radical insurrection. I mean, okay, you got the clown. People died. Well, well one person died, yes, mm -hmm. and she was shot by a federal officer. Yes. And so that was a shame, and that was horrible. Unarmed, by the way, and she was a veteran, and it was really sad. Attempts to assassinate the vice president? Yeah, I don't know if there was an actual assassination attempt. It was a disgraceful day. Don't get okay, me wrong. Great. I'm surely not defending right. it. And, but, you know, you can, you can argue that, that Biden and the left have just taken it and made it their campaign slogan. Weaponized you know? it. And, and so the whole MAGA argument, you know, uh, Biden in last September did a speech just on MAGA. And it was like really divisive. He had the red backdrop. It was really odd. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't think it will work for him. I don't think people are buying it. Mm. The people that do buy it are, are the progressive left that will never vote for Trump or any other Republican yeah. anyway. So I don't think it moves the needle. Yeah, it kind of c compares to when Hillary Clinton called them a bunch of deplorables. That right. obviously didn't go it's down well. Thing, yeah, it's one thing to criticize your political opponents, but don't indict them, don't put them in jail. That's something you'd see in, you know, in Bangladesh or, or Pakistan, not in the United States. I thought you was going to say Nigeria. No, uh, never, but, never. That no, would never happen. Never, uh, uh, never. It would happen. Um, I've got to ask about illegal um, migration. Sure. It's another huge uh, topic, very Enormous. sensitive uh, yeah. for Africans, because, of course, sure. many people flee uh, the continent to look for a better life. Right. Um, but Trump has claimed that the White House are using um, illegal immigrants um, in order to influence the next election. Quite a serious allegation. Yeah, I think, look, Trump, President Trump's always clumsy in his delivery. He likes to be controversial. He's not very disciplined. But if you look at the actual issue, he has a point. Mm -hmm. You know, we have 8 million illegal immigrants since Biden took office. Wow. It'll be 10 and a half or 11 by the end of his term. So th this is unsustainable. You even have Democratic mayors like Eric Adams in New York mm. and, and Johnson in Chicago that have, have really voiced their concerns that yeah. this has to be fixed. Yeah. And I think a lot of Democrats would agree. Biden's polling in the high 20s on his handling of the border crisis. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's not going away. It's a humanitarian crisis that was caused by Biden and his administration. And, and he could fix it, but he just refuses to because I think he's being influenced, obviously, by the, the progressive, I'll call it open border wing of his party. But will it affect the election? I doubt it in the near term. I doubt in 24 because those people will not be citizens. Eligible they won't vote. be eligible to vote. Now, granted, there could be some shenanigans with, with mail-in voting. It, you know, there's a reason why most EU countries don't allow mail-in voting. That's a different topic. But I think it's more the long game. Yeah. He's looking, you know, we've got 11 million new future Democratic voters, because many will be on welfare <clears throat> and will be loyal to the Democratic Party. Over a generation, like most Hispanics, they, now they are, switch over. are switching to being Absolutely. We see right. with the black and blues um, yeah. here in the UK, not everybody mm. of Absolutely. color votes and, and as to soon the as, left. And as soon as you assume that you have locked up that vote indefinitely, it gets you in trouble. It and you're, Biden's seeing that right now. Greg, you've opened a can of worms. And I'm going to have to challenge you on that um, <laughs> when you come back next time. Because, be as here. we said, there's so much going on yeah. this year. But the world's number one election, we are going to be following it carefully with you on Channels Business Global. Greg Swenson, who is, of course, the chairman 
of Republican Overseas UK and uh, the founding partner of investment firm Brig McAdam. Great to be here. Thanks, Juliana. Thank well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But as always, do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time, new time, next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.